Well, hello, students, and welcome to week two of LW305. We are having a look at current developments in the law in the region this week. And I've got a couple of lecture slides to take you through. And then we're going to go and have a little bit of a, a jaunt through some newspapers. And we're going to have a quick look at your readings for the week. So let me share this screen. And let's get underway. So the topic for this week is current developments. Um, there are a lot of current developments in law and they range from issues that have repeated themselves over time and issues which are new and emerging. Really, there is a limit to how many different new developments in law we can cover here. If you look within each country, within each province, within each lawmaking authority, whether that's a council, a village, a parliament, etc., there are so many different issues that are relevant and so many different issues that we could discuss. And what I'm hoping is that you will bring those discussions to the forums. And so I can be exposed to a lot of issues I might not be able to find in newspapers or other sources. And maybe you're exposed to issues from other places which you've never encountered before or which offer you a perspective on perhaps law issues, uh, issues for law reform and policy that, that occur for you wherever it is that you're located. The first thing I wanna say is that law, such as it is in the Pacific, has developed over what we could call four main eras. The first of these is the pre-colonial era. Uh, the second is the colonial era, the post-colonial or the post-independence era, and the contemporary era or now and that's a pretty loose term current issues that sort of can take in things over the last 20 years from modernization to the growing importance of environmental issues and i guess particularly in more recent years with covid uh health and food security although those have uh perhaps always been present in some way in Pacific countries and, you know, elsewhere where natural disasters, um, mono cropping, so having huge plantations of the one type of crop, we've seen historically the, uh, was it taro, Samoan taro exports crashed? Or was it cassava? It was, it was a particular crop. Anyway, we could Google it if we want. You could look it up. And so any issues of disease that occurred with bananas about 50, 60 years ago, and, and we see problems with that. And so diversification, sustainable development, we hear these terms as, uh, you know, solutions to these problems. In the pre-colonial era, there wasn't a lot of what you might call development of the law. There were you know, we are aware there were various feudal systems uh, in or feudal like systems in Polynesia. And there were certainly aspects of that through chiefly systems and alliances and uh, allocations of work, control of labor supply, and so on. Uh, elsewhere in the region, particularly Fiji. Um, law at that time, generally was custom. Uh, after the arrival of settlers, uh, perhaps early whalers, missionaries and others, really once foreign settlements started to appear, we started to see this sort of emergence of uh, the genesis, if you will, of colonial lawmaking structures. And that obviously really took off uh throughout the colonial era so 
from perhaps the very late 1800s, in some places as late as the early 1900s, uh, right through until the you know, 1960s, 70s uh, in most places. Over that period, a lot of introduction of migrants, uh, foreign workers, development of infrastructure, establishment of courts, old buildings, well, they're old now, and, and so on and so forth around the region. In the post-colonial era, we have, you know, this, this era of new constitutionalism, this era of new, I guess, ways of merging indigenous ways of doing things with Western inherited, adopted ways of doing things. And a couple of the features, and, and perhaps, you know, I'm only pointing out the negative on these slides, uh, things like the domination by local elites, those who were perhaps already chiefly, those who already had educations overseas, those who already had money, those who already had power and influence and so on. And the companies they formed and owned and merged and so on, and foreign interests. And we've certainly seen over the 80s and 90s and continuing into the 2000s, the way the elites of our societies in the region have you know, continued to consolidate their power and interests and pass on those benefits to their children and grandchildren. Um, we're starting to see uh, multi-generational political families. We're starting to see you know, multi-generational powerful companies uh, controlling food supplies, supermarkets, beer uh, and having a lot of influence in other other industries tourism fishing construction uh, and agricultural production control of mills and control of government entities so with all of that then is also the foreign interests and ultimately foreign interests aren't concerned with local law or local politics they just want to be able to make money. And so there's a lot of, uh, one of the best ways to do that is to team up with local power structures as the early missionaries and colonial uh, empires did and use those elite and existing power structures to get what they want. And over this era, we've really, and this is the era of law, which sort of we're all quite reliant on now. There's been this washing machine just bouncing around. Perhaps one of the uh, rubber straps on the inside is broken and it's just constantly moving and banging around. We have all of these social and cultural hierarchies and traditions and structures, which are sort of embedded and merged now over the last 30 to 40 years with political systems and this is something you should be very aware of as future lawyers and it's something that it's worth being much more aware of than you might currently be in terms of the history of some of these structures and institutions and how they have developed over time. So as students at USP, you've been exposed to an awful lot of, I guess, material about law and culture and colonialism and so on in the region. So I don't want to wax lyrical about that there's a lot of materials and resources and there's some more materials and resources in your readings for this week. But this is obviously a really rich era of the development of law. And it's, I guess, the colonial and post-colonial eras, these state systems of law rise up alongside the existing structures. 
and those pre-colonial traditions and ways of doing things were themselves fundamentally altered and changed by colonial politics and by politics and social movements in the post-colonial era. Uh, so that when we talk about Pacific ways, which was a real theme of the, this independence era, we're not talking about wearing traditional dresses and having ceremonies. We're talking about different concepts which are normative. They, they make you feel the need to do something like respecting elders. Uh, and those ways and ways of resolving disputes, there's been a lot of reference to this with the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat and recent commentary by the uh, USP Student Union in its response to the Fiji Attorney General uh, very recently saying that there are Pacific ways of resolving disputes, which seems to be referring to consensus building, sitting down and, and getting to uh, a, a conclusion that everybody accepts, if not personally agrees with, maybe they personally agree to it because they've come to it, but there is an acceptance. And so these Pacific ways are then nebulously referred to very vaguely by leaders and used at opportune times, uh, perhaps for political or strategic interests, but at other times in non-political ways or in very positive ways uh, to mobilize support, to mobilize solidarity, to mobilize society, to face society's challenges like COVID and other contemporary challenges that we're about to talk about. Before I talk about them though, there are other paradigmatic issues for current developments in law that are, uh, that I guess provide the framing or the context for the issues that we have today. Paradigmatic, the paradigm, the way things are. The way things are, firstly, is what we term the post-colonial context. Okay, so we're a little bit far on from the post-colonial era, but we are still dealing with all of the changes which have come about from that era. And some of the problems. So I've got here adopted and applied laws. You've heard a lot about those and the way that old laws that aren't relevant might still cause problems. There's been a slow development of autochthonous local jurisprudence, a true Pacific jurisprudence, uh, an interpretation of the common law, which is run through a, a machine that injects it with the Pacific way, whatever that might be, the Solomon Island way, the Malaitan way, the uh, Ikiribus way, or the particular islands or cultures or customary groups, whether that's the north, the center or the south, uh, or whether it's a western province or a northern province or a, uh, et cetera. There are different local ways of doing things and there are different customary laws. And in an ideal world, law and lawmaking, the courts would be reflecting the common law uh, as it interacts with state law. And this isn't a course on jurisprudence, but there is a very clear difference between the way that parliamentary laws are made and develop and the idea of the common law. And it's something which as a law student you hear about, but I think at various points in your life, you will have realizations about what that means in practice as you encounter new situations. So that's going to be a feature for the rest of your life, the way that uh, 
local ways find their way into court proceedings. Another paradigmatic issue is weak state institutions. Um, I don't say this negatively. Um, re reference to weakness here is a reference to things like lack of resources, money, buildings, petrol, vehicles, uh, human resources, sufficiently trained people to do things. Uh, how many expert international trade lawyers are there in Samoa? Experts. I'm talking lawyers with 20 years experience litigating, engaging with international trade law issues. One, zero. What about in Fiji? Zero. Vanuatu, zero. Solomon, zero. Okay. Not a lot of international trade lawyers with decades of experience in the region. Um, what else? What else do we lack in terms of human resources? What else do we actually need? Do you need an international trade lawyer? Arguably, yes. Bureaucratic processes are part of those institutions. How is work done? What are the processes? Is it all on paper? How efficient are the processes? How accountable are the processes? How independent are those processes? To what extent does the bureaucratic state interact or engage with the relational state? That is this network of relationships and uh, institutions that actually, when you look at how things are done, delivers the state to the people. Uh, quite often we find that it's only by picking up the phone and talking to our second cousin who works at the office of so-and-so that we can actually get that office of so-and-so to progress whatever it is we want. And one of the important things for lawyers going, you know, for you as lawyers in the future is that network of relationships. Uh, you get things done through networks, hopefully within the spirit of the law. Land, this is part of the paradigm. Who owns it? What can be done with it? When can you sell it? When can it not be sold? When can you put a mine on it? When can you harvest all the trees on it? When can you uh, put a tourist resort on it? And what are the conditions for that? And who controls that? Huge, huge paradigmatic issues. Land is particularly important because if you look at the history of modern states, which really starts with the Treaty of Westphalia in, uh, in Europe centuries ago. The issue of land is intrinsically linked with the economics of a country. If you have land, you can do things with land that produce wealth. And the entire point of capitalism is, well, one of the main functions of capitalism is the exploitation of land and other resources to create wealth. That's all the system does. And this is the paradigm in which we operate. There is a lot of land that could generate a lot of wealth in the Pacific. But to do that, we would lose where we live. Lots of places don't want to do that. Lots of places don't want to build a mine in the highlands. Lots of places don't want to extract all the coal or the gas or the gold or whatever. They don't want the land disturbed. And that's probably a good thing too. So then what? What are the consequences? And there are a lot of challenges then for the state. So if we're talking about this is the paradigm, this is the way things are. Well, if you're running a country, a fairly small country, and you've got a lot of land that you could, you know, 
develop farming or you could develop good tourism sites or you could develop income generating ventures that create wealth which enable you to fund roads schools hospitals etc then you run into this problem when 95% of the land is owned by different pockets of people that don't want to share it. As a government, it's very hard to govern and to create strong industries when you can't leverage land. So for ex to give you an example, in Australia, uh, there is a provision whereby the federal government can acquire any land uh, for exchange of fair consideration. It's referred to as the compulsory acquisition of land. So the government can say, we want to build a new road right through there, or we want to build a new uh, power plant just there or whatever. And they can require you to sell the land. They can force that and they have to pay you a fair compensation and people get, you know, a good price usually, but you have to leave your land. That is the paradigm in Australia. That paradigm doesn't exist throughout the Pacific. So the way that states are able to operate is very different. And land is very sacred and land is very important. And so this, this is uh, one of the central problems in most Pacific countries what do we do with land and we see that in the courts 60 to 70 percent of cases in Kiribati deal with land the same is true in Vanuatu and elsewhere there's been various efforts of reforming land and the use of land but it's not solved is it it's deeply problematic everywhere another part of this paradigm is this rise in individualism versus collective obligations, uh, which is, I guess, a little bit associated between this division between urban and rural regions as people move to urban areas for jobs and so on, or education, you name it. There is this distancing of indigenous or traditional power structures, uh, but they're not weakened and in some cases they're actually strengthened somebody in the city earning an income and sending reparations uh reparations it's the wrong word um sending money uh forget the term for it now sending money back to uh back to family for uh for their support that's actually a huge source of income for uh regional areas and for uh, people in Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, you name it. So in many ways, this sort of rise of individualism uh, has also been balanced by innovative ways for collective social structures to interact with all of these, these changes. Another part of this paradigm is the idea of free markets versus regulatory protections, government control. So for example, the sale of timber, um, logging, governments like money, they can't control, the, they can't buy and sell the land, they can't do much with the land, but they can maybe convince landowners to harvest the timber or companies can in exchange for a fat check, or governments can mandate that you're not allowed to allow logging and make it a punishable crime to do so or whatever, or impose fines or caps or limits and so on. And where do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line between allowing people to do with their land or with their bodies whatever they want to do versus 
what protections and and control measures we put in place on that how does government influence that and so this these are the these are the paradigms whatever legal issue we're going to look at or deal with all of this stuff is swirling around in the background in the hearts in the minds in the community in the academic papers in the newspapers this is all going on and more I, we could talk for hours about this so i'll talk quickly about a couple of current developments that i hope you're all aware of and uh, then we might go to some of the readings and uh and newspapers and just have a quick look at any other developments we might have missed here something that is emerging as a particularly uh important regional issue is whether or not pacific regionalism as a concept is dying or declining there's a couple of things we're seeing fiji focus its attentions on fnu and funding its national universities and not funding usp at all despite its three campuses thousands of staff and thousands of students that directly benefit from the institution and have done for decades uh why politics money of course what else though well the solomons is quite interested in strengthening its national university and maybe wants to figure out a better way to send solomon students to its universities not to the usp similar issues in vanuatu um we like our mls campus we have a that is a great connection with there and lots of students and, and and members of society who went there but the desire for a national institution that's not controlled by fiji it starts to become more and more present in the current day and similarly in samoa uh, a lot of support for nus over uh usp although we note that the vice chancellor is now based there and so you know perhaps that that will see usp rising uh more to prominence in samoa over the next few years we'll see usp is an important regional institution it educates the vast majority of uh civil society uh at the moment in the region the pacific islands forum secretariat also some cracks they had a bit of an election last year and micronesian leaders were snubbed because australia and new zealand threw their vote behind the cook islands representative i believe and there were some very upset uh stakeholders because it appears as if convention was ignored and it resulted a convention that you know a different block micronesia melanesia polynesia in different years would receive the opportunity to chair pifs and and this doesn't appear to have happened this time there's been cracks in regional fisheries bodies there's been ongoing criticism for a while of the way that existing regional bodies uh, agree on fishing catches and allocate uh, the rights to income from fishing and whether or not they are permitting crews to be exploited illegally um uh, whether they're permitting illegal you know people being paid uh unfair wages people not being paid at all people being kept as slaves on fishing ships and all of this is happening within our waters um and there are cracks in regional bodies for fishing there's new bodies forming there's old bodies fighting with each other and this is a pretty significant issue pacific region 
not a huge population, you know, when you compare it with the rest of the world and how much area it takes up, if you combine the incomes from all Pacific countries, it still doesn't add up to the incomes of quite a, you know, of a, of a middle sized, say European country in terms of economic power and money. And then we have all of these other challenges that we share regionally challenges for education, challenges for transport, challenges for communication, challenges for policing, challenges for security, and challenges for fishing, challenges for mining, challenges for everything, logging, and other things. And the idea of Pacific regionalism has always been around unity in numbers, uh, unity and strength in numbers. But when those cracks start to form, uh, we are divided. And maybe we want to be divided. Maybe we want even more division. Maybe, uh, maybe Bougainville wants to be independent. Maybe the Kanakis want to be independent. Maybe the Malaitans want to be independent. Maybe some countries want to swap islands because the Germans and the French got it wrong. Uh, 50, 60 years ago when they were swapping and trading islands and provinces. I don't know. Obviously, the other big issue of the day, COVID. Um, a lot of different legal issues, social issues, policy issues have all been spawned in the wake of COVID. We're going to look at emergency power as well. You are. Uh, I've looked at them. They're terrible uh, and sometimes necessary. COVID-19 emergency powers. When did Fiji need to be in curfew? Did it need to be in curfew in April last year? Did it need to be in curfew in November last year? What about now? What about two months ago? Does the Solomons need a snap lockdown right now? Does Vanuatu need to lock down? How are those emergency powers used? So is it just lockdowns? Are they being used for other purposes? What other purposes? Are those purposes justified? How do we balance the threat to society of COVID with the various restrictions and impositions we put in place? We've seen an increase of gender-based and sexual violence through COVID, no doubt compounded by increased poverty and hardship, no doubt, uh, you know, fueled as well by the inability for people to move, travel and be out of certain contexts. Uh, for example, uh, being away from men who are getting drunk together. If, if you can't go elsewhere with the kids while men are getting drunk and getting ready to uh, fight or beat or want other things, then how do you protect yourselves and your children, your community? And what are all the men doing that aren't actively involved in gender-based and sexual violence? Are they all standing around watching? What's their role? It's definitely a pretty significant issue for men in society that want to be men uh, to think about how they stop or are involved in stopping violence. Labor law reforms. We've seen some of that in Fiji. We've seen no jab, no job rules come in all around the place. COVID uh, has been a catalyst for all sorts of law uh, reforms and has played a role in all sorts of issues facing society. And no doubt you're going to be discussing them at length in the forums. We've seen very recently in Fiji some very curiously prioritised land and taxation reforms. Perhaps that's misplaced under the heading of COVID. That's got nothing to do with COVID. But a parliament probably has no business 
prioritizing land reforms uh, and prioritizing obscure taxation rules that permit certain individuals who have sold shares but not yet paid tax and exempting them, sorry, exempting such individuals from ever paying tax. Uh, but if you've already paid tax, you can't get it back. Some very strange, weird laws coming in in Fiji. Um, arguments might be made that there's increasing desperation, given that Delta strain got out of hand, and the government might be really, uh, well, uh, trying to uh, grasp at whatever straws they can ahead of the next election to try to look good, a bit like the Australian government which uh, has, has let down the Australian people so badly in recent times. We are seeing, I guess it's not the post COVID era yet, but in the wake of COVID, I mean, COVID is still surging. It's a powerful boat still going, but we're all here in the water, waving our hands in the wake. New development partnerships. So all of this donor funding that, you know, gets touted around on Facebook and in the media. Uh, we're starting to see big development partners who've pulled out all of their staff from Pacific countries because of various government requirements over COVID, again, emergency powers, starting to look at how they re-engage. So things like law and justice sector partnerships. There's a new one for the Solomon Islands being developed, um, 32 or $40 million partnership. There's a big multi-million dollar partnership with PNG that's going through its you know, latest design and, and, and rollout phase. And there's existing projects in Vanuatu and elsewhere, which no doubt are undergoing changes and redesigns so that over the next five years, you know, the length of these sorts of projects, uh, that these projects can perhaps target or be better targeted for the paradigm in which uh, they need to operate over the next five years. Things have changed. A lot has changed over the last two years. So those are just a couple of pretty significant current developments. What else can you come up with? Well, let's, let's share something else. Let's go to, see if I can find it. There it is. I think that's it. Yes. No, don't know where it is. All right, we should be sharing this screen just here. So this was a link uh, I put up on Moodle. It's also, uh, well, it's also in your topic notes to a list of Pacific newspapers. There are others I'm sure that aren't listed here. Um, it's quite interesting looking at this. Uh, it actually lists who owns each of these institutions, these media organizations, which is interesting. Um, we see that in PNG, for example, the very, very conservative Australian Liberal Party leaning US Republican Party leaning Rupert Murdoch News Corporation owns the PNG Post Courier. And we see that the National is owned by a Malaysian logging company. How impartial do you think their reports are on logging? Hmm. Um, but we do see interesting things here. We've got uh, my Tangi Tonga, head of a Tongan media council, seems slightly more independent at least, certainly not attached to government, certainly not attached to business. That seems good. Locally owned newspapers in the Solomons, not sure who owns the Solomon Times. Student journalists, 
All right. So there's others. There's various things. Daily Post gets some criticism in Vanuatu at times for its reporting. So let's go to Fiji Sun. What's making headlines in Fiji? Well, what have we got? There's a bunch of Fijians stuck in Afghanistan. Okay. Is that a current development in Pacific law? Well, there might be various issues coming up here. For example, very soon Fiji is going to have to start engaging with a new Afghan government. So there's actually a big international law issue right here because how do you get six Fijian passport holders out of a desperate conflict situation where the only way in or out is an airport currently under the control of about 4,000 US troops. Um, who's the first phone call to? Who makes that phone call? Do you call the Taliban? Do you reckon the Fiji uh, you know, Department of Foreign Affairs has a direct line to the Taliban? Maybe. Do they call the US? Do they start talking to an ally or partner? Australia and New Zealand are flying planes in and out of there. They've got their own citizens to worry about and it's a desperate place. Are they going to get the Pacific, uh, any sort of Pacific Islanders out of there? And there was a lot of collaboration during COVID. Why not here? We have, what else? An issue of law and justice. A retired soldier killed in Othala Beach trying to break up a fight between uh, his drunken son and his drunken son's drinking buddies. And uh, people came back with their cuzzy bros and stomped and killed people. Nice, really, really tragic story there. Um, but an issue, I mean, we've got We've got increasing community violence during COVID. Um, we've, we've simply got violence within a, within a community. It's a settlement this broke out in. That's got its own issues in terms of land and, and, and so on. How do you find land for people? What else is here on the Fiji sun? Okay, bit of rugby, good, gotta stay happy. Are things getting worse in India? That's a global issue, not a current development in Pacific law. Climate Watch, we've got a photo feature series, which uh, you know, is looking at Naloto village and sea level rise. Environmental issues are very current. What's the Fiji Times talking about? Well, USP for some reason isn't on the front page of the Fiji Sun. We're talking about USP and governance, we're talking about the problems uh, for how the university can govern itself in different regional ways. We have a review, expert to review a proposed bill. So we've engaged the service of an Australian expert to review a town planning act. Okay, so there's been a lot of discussion in Fiji over the past 10 to 15 years regarding, uh, well, village, village uh, councils, regarding uh, land use. This was, you know, we mentioned this a moment ago in the, uh, when we went through the slides, town planning, where you can build things, how you can build things, the standards, the sewerage and so on. Okay, so why do we need an Australian expert to review the bill? What does an Australian expert know about town planning in Fiji? Well, I mean, we, we might say that there's, you know, certain things that, you know, if, if you've got a person that's done town planning a lot, they're an expert, they've looked at a lot of bills and acts, they've written a lot of bills and acts, they've done town planning in this place, in that place, in this other place, all these places with different needs and demands, then towns in Fiji are just places with different sets of needs and demands. And so 
an expert can probably offer opinions, but they probably don't deeply know the context, but perhaps they're not being asked to review the act to make sure it draws in the Pacific way. Perhaps they're being asked to review the act to make sure, you know, there isn't some good practice in town planning that's become normal in a place like Australia or somewhere. That's a good thing that Fiji might want to draw in. I don't, I don't quite know the terms of reference of that. Maybe one of you is going to write an assignment on it and I'll get to learn about it. Substandard building applications. Okay. So we've got, we've got an issue there over planning laws over well who's doing the building applications hopefully lawyers aren't drafting those or assisting wouldn't want lawyers involved in substandard anything would we civil servants applying for unemployment assistance presumably this means employed civil servants not unemployed civil servants servants yeah so we have questions there over Oh, let's click that article. Let's see what that takes us to. Okay, yeah. Even though they were being paid with wages and salaries. Well, he's got a lot of, uh, he's definitely got some good data. Okay. So I have to have had the vaccine. So we've got some good statistics here, but um, I think we've also, you might have seen on uh, social media, I certainly have, uh, that perhaps a lot of that $360 has gone over the counter at the local grog shop or the local bottle shop or to buy cigarettes. And perhaps there's some pretty big parties in some places. And that's what people needed to spend their money on. And that's what they did. Okay, so there's a whole lot of issues that's dealing with welfare laws. What else we got in the region? Wow, island business, don't let the forum fail. So that's a, you know, that's front and center for them. The economic outlook, COVID-19 continues to wreak havoc on the region's economies. But what is the outlook for the remainder of 2021? What is the outlook for the remainder of 2021? Well, here's an overview by these people. We won't go, there's a lot of text in there. What's happening in Samoa? New government, decline in GDP, people in Samoa are resilient. Hurrah! And the Solomons, GDP contracted, but it's expected to rebound and COVID has delayed this massive hydroelectricity project. So this is a nice little overview, isn't it? Of things that are happening economically in the region. That's nice. There's probably a lot of policy issues, a lot of laws and a lot of law reform hanging off all of those things. Pivoting post Fiji. Not sure what that article is about. Maybe you want to click and have a look at it. More oil companies coming in. Code red for human driven global heating warns the UN chief. IPCC report, climate change. Students welcome VC's return. Okay, we've got regionalism here again. We've got a personal reasons resignation. Tell me how many people who are bureaucrats within Fiji have resigned for personal reasons since 2010. That's one statistic that we might like to see the Fiji Sun report on. Perhaps they're closer to the sources, the Samoan Observer. Climate change. Also a police commissioner resigning, but that's, uh, I thought that 
was fairly old news that Ian Kyle had done that a little while ago, but it's, it's happening there. The ongoing politics. A fatal car crash. So this is a tragedy, obviously. And what can we, you know, we don't, I don't want to go into, well, let's, let's have a look and see what, what this is about. Okay. Subscribe to read the article. We can't read the article. I'm not subscribed, but there could be issues of road safety. There could be issues of licensing and registration. There could be issues of vehicle safety and inspections. There's a lot of legal issues, which don't have to be the biggest issue that might touch upon these sorts of tragic stories. A new public health emergency that's under control. A policy need, we need more doctors. Well, it takes a while to train a doctor, uh, at least six to seven years. Uh, and then they have to come back with relevant experience. So this is a, this is a big issue. Exports, agriculture, again, an issue I touched upon before. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you strongly enter a global market when you can't guarantee production? If you're trying to sell copra and people aren't collecting the coconuts, people aren't processing the co coconuts, then how do you guarantee uh, contracts for the supply of copper, for example? Does government not involve itself in that? Does it just leave that to business? We've got a sea cucumber hall, okay. We've got more uh, law and justice issues. More law and justice issues. And then we've got world issues. Okay. So that's some um, our observer. Where are we at here? The Solomon star snap 36 hour lockdown. So Honiara is in lockdown as an emergency zone due to a surge of COVID globally and in neighboring countries. Okay. So this is being mooted as a need to just test preparation. As far as I can see, there's no outbreak. But cabinet approved the trial, presumably under their uh, emergency powers or presumably under some other power of cabinet to impose a lockdown. Are they allowed to do that? That would be a good one to see students talk about. What is the authority for a test lockdown? Okay, good, great. What else we got? The Solomon Times, suspicious yachts, probably smuggling drugs. There's another regional issue. Reference to Tommy Baker, PNG's purported Ned Kelly, the Baker boys. Is that a good one? Uh, is, is what law and justice issues does that raise? What else we got here? Carver booms, small business issues, PUBG mobile. That's an interesting one in Solomon Islands, culture and arts. So culture and arts, COVID, Carver, tourism and PUBG mobile. Excellent. Is there anything else there? Uh, uh, no drink cast Shakespeare really think the Solomon times could get a perhaps more locally robust culture and art section, but uh, any students want to put their hand up, send something in. Oh, this is a bit graphic. So the daily post, sorry, if you're upset about that, it's much nicer to look at this lovely man um, featured stories here. Okay. So we've got cattle dying uh, in transit. That's a huge issue for agriculture. That's a huge issue for animal welfare. There are laws on that. 
there are rules, there are regulations, there are conditions which much must be complied with. Clearly cattle are dying on boats, that's a problem. Um, they were the cattle for National Agriculture Week. Oh, that is concerning, right? Uh, and quite tragic, quite, quite tragic. Shops selling expired food products. This is not unique to Vanuatu, is it? Uh, throughout the region, I've bought my fair share of expired food in, in Kiribati and I've avoided it as well as I can at Kostulas in Suva. Um, fees, what else we got? Netball's not just for girls. Okay, that's probably not a legal issue. Uh, tourism. So we're talking about re, you know, partnerships here, uh, local, but probably also international uh, through Productive Tourism Long Yumi initiative. Okay. So I guess that's, uh, well, that's tourism, that's business, that's trade. There's, I'm sure there's legal issues that feed into all of that. Uh, travel restrictions certainly feeds into that. What else we got? Climate change. I think these are all historic articles there. We have a stock market ticker, which is interesting over here. Uh, okay. And popular articles. People don't want to give the Queenslanders carver plants to grow. Ralph Reganvanu urges Australia not to grow carver. Please don't grow carver. I wish to say to Australia, our friend, don't grow carver. Well, uh, here's the thing. Uh, they already grow carver in Australia. It grows naturally in Queensland because it's a tropical place that a long, long time ago uh, was connected to other places in the region. And there's carver plants there. So maybe it's, it's about protection of local industries. Um, maybe this is more of an opportunity though. Maybe Vanuatu could buy land in Australia and grow carver on it. Maybe clever Vanuatu and Fijian and Solomon's business people could uh, get together and work with Queensland producers to license the use of certain types of carver to license certain names of carver. Uh, it certainly would, um, you know, why don't you brand two day carver? Why don't you brand golden carver? Why don't you brand these things and use those brands, get those brands recognized globally. And yes, Australia can grow carver, but in order to sell it as that premium product that it, you know, it might be, they have an arrangement to use these brands. So what sort of laws does that touch on? That touches on patent and trademark laws, intellectual property laws. It might deal with the complex laws around genetically modified or uh, there's, there's DNA uh, patenting of certain crops. We see it with Monsanto, we see it in the US and elsewhere. Okay. I'm not going to go through every single other link here. I think we've done enough. Uh, I think I've done enough in this time to demonstrate to you that there are many, many current developments in Pacific law and surely one of those interests one of you. And I'm looking forward to seeing what topics you pick up and pre uh, present in the forums. And I'm looking forward to seeing what topics you pick up and uh, write your group project and your individual project on. I'm going to pause to take a breath and now very quickly turn my attention to your readings. Allow me to bring this over here and I will make a new share. And 
And how do I share the screen? Okay. All right. I'm hopefully now sharing. Yes, it looks like it is. This is your topic guide. Very brief one, this one. Um, bit oddly formatted too. Read through this, click the links. Maybe do some of your own research. But I touched on these issues in the lecture slides and we have found some of these issues on the daily newspapers. Pacific regionalism, COVID-19. There is a study task here. Resources for this are on Moodle. I can see how many students access those resources. I'm going to be very curious watching how many students and which students choose to access those resources over the next seven to 14 days. Uh, I have my suspicions. I can see how many students viewed the lecture on YouTube and it's not all of you yet. Uh, so we'll see how well resources are getting utilized within the course. The Samoa constitutional crisis. We haven't talked about this. You can read about it. And there's some more study tasks. Quite importantly, look at some of these study tasks. Immigration and law issues. This is a particular issue from Vanuatu from a few years ago. Question, is it a law reform or a policy issue? Explain if both explain how they're linked. Why am I asking you questions like this? I don't know. Maybe, maybe you might be assessed by me asking you these sorts of questions in your exam at some point. Maybe not this question, but maybe identifying the difference between law reform and policy issues will be important to your exam. Maybe your ability to explain the difference. What do you think it is? What is the difference between a law reform issue and a policy issue? Well, next week, we're gonna be talking about problems in the law reform process. We might come up with a definition then, but law and policy are quite linked, aren't they? We'll talk about that next week. This is your other main assigned reading for the week. So this is on the web, this is on Moodle. And I've also directly linked it into my message. Wanting you to read this chapter, Modernization and Development in the South Pacific. Let's go through it very quickly, shall we? I've highlighted a few things and I will leave this for you to read, but I might just go through some of these highlighted sections to just cherry pick a few things to talk to you about. Okay, firstly, social change is everywhere and affects everyone. Okay. Globalization, strong states, powerful corporations, the rise of communication, the internet, mobile phones, and PISA, the way business has changed, the way economics is changing, etc. Governments want higher standards of living, don't they? Hopefully. Individualism, tensions with collective obligations, market forces and regulations, disparities between urban and rural. Historical. Okay, if we start in Europe, once upon a time, we had an agricultural revolution, an industrial revolution, a political revolution. And over time, scholars thought a lot about these things, which gave rise to social change. And here's some of their names. There's a lot more. Max Weber is possibly of great interest to a lot of lawyers. He wrote a lot about lawyers. All of these Western thinkers, and they are, 
had similar perspectives on the world that human societies change from being quite small uh, family groups to being complex, very, very diverse things like the societies we see today. And in their view, you had primitive savages historically and in the new world and in the Pacific and in Africa and other places they discovered. And Europe was of course held up as the pinnacle of civilization. And that's why of course, Europeans were able to dominate the rest of the world. Well, okay. That's not to say that what these people thought was necessarily wrong. It just might not always apply in all places. So they're saying that we go from one institution, which provides everything to specialist institutions. And these occur through various mechanisms of change, right? Different. I think something we can take home from this is that look, certainly different places in the world have different starting conditions. You know, take it, take a snapshot of Fiji today and take a snapshot 20 years ago. Now compare those snapshots with Samoa or Tonga or Australia or France. These are different places with different features and different conditions. And all of those things are interlinked and are complex and all change and regulate uh, every part of society affects every other part and individuals. New ideas, new technologies emerge and come to places at different times. And these mechanisms of change mean that we all go in different places over time. Over time, we diverge. So Jowett refers to these, or well, it's not Jowett, it's Naidu who wrote this, Professor VJ Naidu. Uh, refers to these people as evolutionists, right? So these are these different stages. We have access to other views and we're about to talk about them. Historically, yeah, Islanders were not seen as people who had the same uh, capacities or uh, I guess worth as Europeans, which is obviously not true. Coming up through modernity. So you can see this is now entering into getting quite close to the post colonial or the, the early independence era. Behind a lot of the new things that came during that time, whether it was parliaments or laws or police forces or whatever, were efforts to change the values and attitudes of society and the way society is structured. And those changes, we still feel their effects today. We've seen this these changes through education, these changes through democracy, these changes through our, our access to the public sphere, the public debate of politics of the issues of the day. Our ability to earn money, our ability to save money, our ability to do different things, to hoard wealth. There's other theories, of course. Under development theory, Vijay Naidu says, is an attempt to explain these sorts of changes that have taken place in uh, developing countries through a different lens. Under development theory says that, well, it's actually those European powers, those civilized people who only became civilized because they exploited the wealth and natural resources slavery, land, etc., of the developing world or the new world. And the world system was and still is managed by powerful states for their own benefits. Is China only serving Pacific interests when it 
wants to fund ports, when it wants to build stadiums, is Australia. Well, whose interests are more important to, uh, or whose interests are more aligned with what we want to do locally? A whole lot of local uh, and some foreign uh, theorists have discussed this stuff in great detail and researchers. Transnational capital and interests. It was once explained to me in this way, globalization is like a, a freight train, a, a very fast moving train. And uh, maybe it's a passenger train, passenger train. And on that train are all of the countries of the world. There's, you know, represented by one individual. And there's seats at the back of the train and there's right up the front, there's the first class seats with the, you know, luxury padding, champagne, you name it. Uh, all the good food, everything nice. And developing countries often aren't even necessarily on that train yet. They're standing on the platform waiting to get on the train. But as the train gets closer and closer to the station, they realize that the train isn't stopping. It's just going to keep on steaming past. So if you want to be on that train, if you want to be part of that global capitalist system and everybody wants phones, everybody wants vaccines, everybody wants new cars, everybody, not everybody, everybody wants clothes, everybody wants you name it. There are products, commercial things. So we want to be on the train so that the people can have the, the good things. And maybe by luck, you jump and grab onto the back of the train and, and, and climb on. And then what? Well, if you're lucky, there might be a spare seat at the back of the train. But nobody's inviting you to take their seat. Nobody's letting you get into the first class section, maybe for a visit maybe to serve the trolley of food. And this sort of explains the way the world currently is organized. And if you don't have a lot of power in that system, that's the way it's going to continue to be organized, isn't it? Despite whatever you wish. And it's only once you start accepting the paradigm, the hand, the cards you've been dealt, that you can start to choose what you're going to do with that, to play those cards strategically, to, you know, to do things in, in ways that are going to benefit you, to make those alliances that will most benefit you. Perhaps to stand up as a region so that you have strength in numbers. There's lots of ways of discussing gender, or development or sustainable development in different ways. Regional organizations, what happens if they fall apart? An important point from here, social change is inevitable. Pacific societies have always been changing, but they've accelerated that change. We can see some of these eras discussed here, historic actions of missionaries, historic actions of business. How do these historic things affect us today? How do missionary based enterprises align with the individuals in our societies or companies in our societies that control certain resources or control certain industries. I don't know. Land. Very big issues over land. Labor laws, blackbirding, slavery. Okay. The issues of urbanization, the issues of, building infrastructure, who pays for infrastructure, who determines what is worth value. We have alternative systems, don't we, in Vanuatu and elsewhere, 
there are uh, customary banks. I'm not sure what the term is in Vanuatu. Uh, banks where you can go and get a loan if you've got a dowry to pay or if you need uh, to pay restitution for something, you can go and borrow pigs or pig tusks or, or other resources and then you have to pay that back. So there are banks in traditional commodities. Who set that up? Was it the state in Vanuatu or was it uh, the uh, Council of Chiefs? The colonial state, issues of indirect rule. Okay. So I will leave you uh, to read through some of this quite interesting stuff written nearly 20 years ago now. Education, how relevant is this? Literacy rates, have they gone up or down since 2003? How has family changed? How have clubs, dance halls, nightclubs, pubs and cinemas changed the way people meet other people or seduce them or interact with them? How have cultures changed? And actually, now that you mention it, how resilient has culture and tradition been? Because given how much of our economies are actually still controlled by very strong customary bound uh, institutions and people. Is this actually, uh, is this actually a problem? Are we losing tradition? Are we losing custom or are those adapting and integrating and not integrating with, are they, drawing the state and economic and other systems into traditions? Are they autochthonizing? Are they making those systems local? What do you think? Has there been an indigenization of modernity? Is there a new Pacific way? There's certainly been good things from development. There's certainly been good things that we take from the rule of law or law and order. And there's lots of bad. So to what extent have, have we drawn, have we accepted the positive and rejected the negative? So that's about as much as I want to go through of your reading. Um, there's, been a lot of change there are a lot of current developments um but in terms of where we are today uh we are still in the middle of all of this paradigm of of change of this timeline of this ebb and flow over time of all of these different interacting systems and I think what I'd like to see from you is a, is a, is a robust discussion of a lot of these topical issues in the, uh, in the forums. That's the end of the lecture. And, uh, and that's the end of what I'm going to take you through today. Good luck with the rest of the week. I hope you don't find the readings overly challenging and I look forward to talking to you on Friday if you want to talk to me or uh, next week. Cheers. Bye for now.